All right, so welcome back to Learn SDR with Prof. Jason. Today we're going to talk about carrier phase synchronization, and we're going to use a, a Custis loop, which is a GNU radio block. And after today, you'll have a complete set of tools to build a phase coherent transmitter and receiver, something like a, a phase shift keyed transmitter and receiver, whether it's a binary phase shift keyed or a quadrature phase shift keyed or a multi level phase shift keyed or even uh, one of those QAM constellations with a square, uh, square pattern. All those things are all involve, uh, all re require both timing synchronization to sample right where the transitions uh, between symbols happen and also carrier phase synchronization. So let me just motivate this a little bit. And let me remind you that what we, what we saw earlier when I talked about what what happens inside of the SDR. So the receiver's antenna is some real signal, and it's some amplitude times a cosine of two pi times some high radio frequency, you know, gigahertz-ish times time, plus some phase offset that just depends on where time equals zero started and where you're sitting in the electromagnetic wave that's coming at you. Whether at exactly time equals zero, you happen to be at a peak of this cosine or not. And this in the SDR turns into the complex signal that you get out, a sampled version of this complex signal, which is some amplitude that's proportional to the original amplitude. Of course, there's attenuation and reamplification, but let's just say it's, it's roughly the same, uh, certainly proportional, times the same phase shift, but now instead of being a phase shift in a uh, shifting around a cosine, it's a phase shift in a complex exponential. So it's, it's e to the i times 2 pi times the frequency difference now, this high frequency minus the frequency that the software-defined radio is tuned to times time, plus this extra phase difference. And the, the phase shift at radio frequencies sticks around and is, is present in your complex number. So it's, it's basically the same argument, but the frequency has been shifted down by some amount. And, and so relative phase, if we modulate the relative phase by moving ahead 90 degrees or behind 90 degrees, we will see that moving ahead or behind in our complex number. And that was the whole point of the binary phase shift keying and quadrature phase shift keying and the other, other phase shift keying methods. So the, the problem with these methods, the thing that makes these tricky is that the hardware clocks are never perfectly matched for one. So you're never gonna, exactly match your uh, SDR's hardware clock. And, and secondly, even if they were tracking at exactly the same rate, they would never be in perfectly in phase. So imagine somehow you perfectly synchronized your clocks so that the, the peaks and troughs arrive at the receiver exactly when the receiver's clock expects the peaks and troughs, troughs to arrive. So you know, say you've, uh, say you've purchase the best atomic clocks at the transmitter and the receiver, and you synchronize them both to GPS, everything is perfect. And the receiver is receiving some incoming electromagnetic wave with, with moving peaks and troughs. So say you're receiving uh, five gigahertz Wi-Fi and your laptop, and you only have to move your laptop about an inch. So that's two and a half centimeters for the metric people. You only have to move about that much in order for the clocks to become Nine, uh, 180 degrees out of phase. So where your receiver clock, your perfectly synchronized atomic frequency clock used to expect a peak, now you've moved it over half of a wavelength and now you're gonna get a trough instead. And so you can't, uh, you can't imagine clocks to be that accurate and you, you just can't rely on things, the, the phase of these clocks being, being in sync. You just have to deal with both of those problems. You turn the thing on at some arbitrary time. So the, the, there's some arbitrary, time equals zero, and therefore some arbitrary phase offset from that. And uh, we'll have to deal with arbitrary frequency offsets. We already showed how to deal with really big frequency offsets with this sort of balanced scale frequency lock loop method. And today we'll do the fine tuning. We'll, we'll really lock on to the correct phase. So you might be a little bit surprised by this moving the laptop over a little bit because you say, well, you know, that RF stuff is happening at, at gigahertz, but my my software-defined radio is only sampling at, at megahertz. I, I should be much less sensitive to this, but as part of the conversion process, remember any phase and any relative phase 
comes along for the ride. And the reason why that happens is there is a clock in the software defined radio running at those gigahertz rates in order to do this conversion process. And the phase of that clock is really gonna matter. Of course, in the real world, we don't even have really fancy atomic clocks locked to some absolute GPS time reference. So in addition to having some arbitrary phase offset, uh, the, the frequency is gonna shift a little bit. And small frequency offsets correspond to phases that slowly move around. And we'll see that, uh, we'll see that now. So let's, let's, took a, let's take a look at a demo. And the demo I'm gonna show you is basically a simplified version of where we left off last time. All right, so this is a simplified version of where we left off last time. We have uh, a random source that's getting packed into bytes to send to this constellation modulator. The constellation I'm using is binary phase shift keying, BPSK. So this is turning these bits into plus ones and minus ones and then smoothing them out with our root raised cosine pulses. Um, I'm reducing the amplitude of that a little bit so it fits within the plus and minus one of the Pluto. And I'm showing what I'm sending and sending it out to Pluto. Now on the receiver side, I made a few simplifications. Um, on my, my, my receiver, I'm showing uh, what I get in time and I'm continuing to do this kind of by hand frequency offset. So I'm multiplying what I get from the, the RTLS DR by a complex exponential, which I'm gonna tune by hand still a little bit. So I, I actually removed the frequency lock loop. And that's because I, I wanna show you, I can tune it. Once I have the tuning by hand, I can actually get it slightly more, uh, more accurate. And I can go a little bit higher and a little bit lower and, and show, you, uh, show you what the result is. I'm still passing it through an automatic gain control and showing the result of, of all that. And then instead of doing all the frequency lock loop stuff, I'm sending it right to my symbol sync, my timing, my timing, synchronizer, uh, timing synchronizer. So this, um, this matches the, the symbol clock and interpolates if it has to in between actual samples that we're receiving so that what it spits out are uh, one sample per symbol, which should be right at the plus one or right at the minus one. The last time I showed that this, this process is insensitive to overall phase shifts, so overall rotations of the constellation. And it's even insensitive to pretty slow, slow rotation. So this symbol sync is gonna work even if we're slightly off. So then I'm gonna show the result there. And finally, I'm gonna show what we're gonna do today. Pass it through this Costas loop and, uh, and show that. So that's, that's what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna tune a little bit high and a little bit low. And I'm gonna show you what this Costas loop is doing. Okay, so this is the stuff we're transmitting. This is the spectrum of the stuff we're transmitting. The receiver looks pretty good. Um, it's maybe a little bit low. I can increase the, the gain. It's fine. Uh, you can sort of see this slow modulation here, this slow envelope of sines and cosines in the real and imaginary parts. And I'm gonna to try to tune that out by slightly changing this complex exponential that I'm multiplying by. Oh, so that's going in the wrong direction. Let me go in this direction. And if I, if I really match it pretty well, um, the, the overall envelope of sines and cosines is gonna go away. It's pretty slow. And this is the, the symbols that I'm getting out that are one, one sample per symbol. And let me try to tune it even better here. All right, so there we go. Now, now there's very little modulation and you can see on this constellation plot that before the Costa loop, that's what's in blue, I get a, a series of thousand points and they're kind of smeared around and they're, they're moving back and forth a little bit. And if I get it really tuned pretty well, you can see that the, the little 1,024 points there, now they're rotating. They're rotating pretty slow up. Now they're rotating the other direction pretty slow. Now they're going back and forth. So you can see the clocks are slowly drifting. And well, what the Costa loop is, is doing is it's picking up on this these fre the frequency of the phase offsets of each of those points, and it's compensating for them and it's tracking the carrier offset. And the longer I wait, the longer the clocks are gonna drift out of phase. So if I, get it, if I get it matched so that these things are small and they're sort of spinning around maybe once per second, um, I'm transmitting signals that are pretty close to a gigahertz. And so what that means is I have my clocks matched to to one hertz. So I, ha I have my clocks matched to about one part in a billion, which is, which is pretty good. 
but that's not going to last very long. Yeah, see there, now it's going the other way. All right, so we want to see how does the Costas loop do this so that it, it can kind of automatically slide the slider back and forth and do it in such a way that not only does the motion stop, but it, it stops right on the plus one and minus one of these red dots. So that what comes out, at least for binary phase shift keying, is all real and no imaginary. Let me show you one more thing before we dive into how the Costas loop works, which is to show how it works with not binary phase shift keying, but quadrature phase shift keying. And so here, if I were to play this, there are four different symbols to choose from. It's plus and minus one in the real and the imaginary axis. And if I tune my radio, sort of do this fine tuning and do the fine tuning by eye here, see if I can do this. It's a little bit harder to do with the, there we go. So now you see four little lumps of blue spots that are spinning around kind of randomly. And I'm, I'm really trying to track it by hand. It's not easy. And the Costas loop in this case is successfully locking those four different symbols onto where they belong, plus and minus one in the real and the imaginary axis, or at least uh, maybe not plus and minus one, but plus and minus, uh, uh, well, it's, it's a, a magnitude of one. So it's uh, one over root two in each axis. So here, let me, I'm already off. Let me try to retune here. There we go. Yeah, so you, there, that's pretty good. There are four, four pretty clustered points moving back and forth and the Costas loop locks them really onto four, four points on the unit circle that correspond to my four symbols. All right, so let me show you how this Costas loop works. I'm gonna draw the complex plane. I'm gonna draw what we saw which is a real axis, which is sometimes called the in-phase part, and the imaginary axis, which is sometimes called the quadrature part. And we had our constellation of symbols, and I'm gonna do the example for QPSK because um, once you understand that, the, uh, the binary phase shift keying is, is much easier, but it's the, the quadrature phase shift keying that, that generalizes to any constellation. So uh, we had our, our, our symbols here on the unit circle. Look like that, look like that, look like that, and look like that. And this is what we're transmitting. So at every time the symbol clock clicks, we're going to be transmitting one of these four complex numbers. And in between, it's going to sort of slowly transition. And when we sample at the right clock period, we get something that's on the unit circle. But what we get, if our phases aren't matched, is a rotated version of this. So we might get a bunch of points that are over here, say, and then a bunch of points that are over here, and a bunch of points that are over here, a bunch of points that are over here. And if the, if the frequency is off, rather, and not just the phase, this, these little cluster of points actually go around in some particular direction. So they'll so say the, the we're off in such a way that the little cluster of points is, is rotating like that. All right, so, so what do we need to do? The, we need to uh, figure out what the phase difference is between the, the point that I'm getting in and the point, uh, the constellation point where I should be and compensate for that. And now, of course, things are quite noisy. So we'll need to smooth out any estimate of our phase offset and things are moving. So we'll have to track that phase offset. So let me, let me show you how, uh, let me show you what to do. So if we could estimate this offset and let me, let me draw some, uh, some lines here. So I'll pretend that we just got one of these points right in the center. And so we're going to say, well, this, this should, this should have been this, this constellation point over here. And that constellation point happens, let me call that A, which I'll write as um, A in phase part plus I A quadrature part. So a little bit, this is very standard notation, but it's a little bit confusing because the real part has a subscript of capital I, whereas the imaginary part, which you might think has a subscript of I actually has a subscript of capital Q. So just keep that in mind. Um, and 
say the, the point that I just got, one of these points here, I'm going to call that uh, I'm going to call that z, and z will just be x plus i y. That's uh, that'll be a little bit easier to to notate. Um, let me call, and and it's at some other angle. So let's let's have this z be at some angle phi, and let's have the other one be at some angle phi sub a for the constellation point. And what we want is we want the difference. We, we want to calculate theta here. So theta is the, the difference angle. And if we could have an estimate for theta, and we could track that estimate, even though the points are, are noisy and moving, uh, we can compensate for it by, by derotating the constellation, by multiplying. So this is rotated this way. And to derotate it, we would want to uh, uh, multiply it by e to the minus i theta. So let me just give two points here. If, if we knew theta, we could derotate by taking our z and multiplying by e to the minus i theta. And so um, that's, that's one option. Uh, we'll, we'll sort of pursue a, a slightly a slight variant on that, which is that we will we will do this derotation based on our best guess, and we'll try to drive theta to zero. And any any non-zero theta we'll use to adjust what our best guess is, and we'll keep track of both the 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 rate that this thing is rotating and its kind of absolute phase at any given time. So option number two is to if if we can estimate theta, uh, we can drive drive it to zero um, with a feedback loop with with a control loop. Loop. That's not how you spell loop. So this is much like we. This is basically what I was doing by hand. I was looking to see how far it was off and tweaking my slider a little bit back and forth to uh, to try to get it to to one to stop and two to stop right on where I wanted it to stop. And this is pretty hard to do by hand, but you know, computers are good. Digital signal processing is good. So let's let's see if we can automate this. So. Um, Let's write to the let's write the the math behind what's going on here and try to come up with an estimate for for what theta is, and I'll show you how to incorporate that into a control loop. So so the data points in green here, the data is z, which is x plus i y. All of this has been normalized with the automatic gain controller to live on the unit circle, so it's just going to be some one times e to the i phi for QPSK. Um, my constellation, which is this. So let me just rewrite it. A is a i plus i a sub q. This is also normalized on the unit circle. This is going to be e to the i phi sub a. And what we want, which is in blue here, we want theta. And theta is just the difference between these angles. So it's just phi, the, the angle for the data, minus phi sub a, the angle for the, the ideal constellation. All right, so how do we get that? Well, we could consider the complex number z times a star. And if I write that out in, in uh, components here, or not, not in components, in uh, uh, magnitude and phase, since both the magnitudes are one, this is just e to the i phi minus phi sub a. And, uh, and if I actually do this multiplication component by component, sample by sample, 
I can then calculate the phase of this by taking an arc tangent. So theta, the thing we want, is just the, the phase, the angle of z a star, which is an arc tangent of what? Well, it's the arc tangent of some uh, some point. So let's let me redraw our data point here. Just to remind you how how these arc tangents work. So if I have z equals x plus i y, and this is x, and that is y, and if my angle is phi here. If I want to know phi, I could, I could consider the tangent of phi. The tangent of phi is opposite, which is y, over adjacent, which is x. So the tangent of phi is y over x. So if I want theta itself, I would just calculate the arctangent of y over x for this example, or in general, the arctangent of the real part, real part of the thing I, I have over the imaginary part. Z a star. Jason's from the future here. That should have been arc tangent of the imaginary part, the y over the real part. It's not going to affect everything we do in the future. I just wanted to make sure that was there. All right. So, so this is one way of estimating theta. We have to do this symbol by symbol and and this operation of calculating an arc tangent is pretty slow. It's much slower than just kind of doing the, the component multiplication piece by piece. Well, let me let me uh, let me give you a simplification though, and and that is that what we we don't really need theta itself. If we're going to put something into a control loop, what we have is uh, an oscillator that's running to hopefully compensate the phase. And any remaining phase, this theta that we're calculating, should end up being a very small error on uh, what we already have. So you know, if one of the clocks happens to drift a little bit due to temperature, or if we move around a little bit and the clock drifts, then, uh, then we'll, we'll have to update our, our, uh, our oscillator that's compensating for, for this, this phase. But we only need to nudge it around in the right direction. And we do enough nudges, and it'll eventually settle on the right place. So the, the Costas loop in particular doesn't bother calculating this arc tangent. It just notices that, that the, the tangent of theta for really small thetas is really close to theta itself. And the sine of theta is also really close to theta itself for small theta. Uh, this is a small angle approximation, which as a physicist, I, I do all the time. Another thing, so if, if tangent of theta is pretty close to theta, then arc tangent of theta is also pretty close to theta. Arc tangent of theta. And if you want to be convinced, at least sort of graphically, if I just plot as a function of theta, I plot theta itself, it's a straight line. And if I were to plot sine of theta, it sort of does this. So this is theta at sine of theta. Now, what does tangent of theta do? Well, tangent of theta starts going, going up and then it kind of diverges. And certainly once it diverges, we're not, we're not particularly close. Tangent of theta. Now, what does arc tangent of theta do? Well, arc tangent of theta kind of comes in from over here and then joins everyone else for some region and then and asymptotes aren't there. And so as long as you're at small theta, you're in this linear region where all of these functions are pretty much the same. Let's pick one that is really easy to calculate without doing lots of trig. So we want an arc tangent of something, but in particular, it's a lot easier to calculate the sine of theta. So what is the sine of theta? Well, the sine of any of these angles on the complex plane is just um, opposite the imaginary part over the hypotenuse, over the magnitude. And after our, after our automatic gain control, 
in order to match our constellation, all the magnitudes are, are one, so we don't have to worry about that. Or if we happen to scale to some different number, we could just un undo that constant scaling. Um, so calculating the, the sign is just a matter of taking the imaginary part and dividing by one. So that's something that can, can be done pretty simply. So this theta here, uh, a good approximation to theta that the constant cube loses, uses is that this theta is really close to just the imaginary part. of z a star. And well, what is that? Let's, let's actually multiply. What is z a star? So I'll erase my little small angle graph. So this is the imaginary part of z, which is x plus i, y, and a star, which is the in phase part minus, because we've complex conjugated, a q, or minus i, a q. Well, if I only want the imaginary part, I don't have to do all the multiplies. I just have to track the imaginary one. So this is real. Here's an imaginary part. This is y times a sub i. And here's another imaginary part. So. Um, oh, sorry, here's a, sorry, this is the real part. And then the other, the imaginary part is this. So minus X A sub Q. So note that we're sort of doing uh, what's called a, uh, well, this looks like a cross product here. We're taking the product of the imaginary part of our data and the in phase part, which is the real part of our constellation point minus the real part of our data and the imaginary part of our constellation point. And, and this is a pretty good approximation as, as long as the, the loop has dragged this thing toward the, toward the nearest constellation point. And even, even when you're not in the perfectly linear region, you've still got the sign right. You're still going to nudge the, the compensating oscillator in the right direction. So let me actually draw what the loop structure is for the Costas loop. And uh, I think that will maybe help put all these pieces together. All right, let me draw the structure of the, the Costas loop, the feedback mechanism that gives us what we want. So we have this incoming data. And this is a complex number, so I'll draw two lines here. And the first thing we're going to do with that is we're going to multiply it by a by a compensating phase factor. So something that looks like e to the minus i theta. Or really, I, I should write this as something that looks like e to the minus i omega t. That's what we're going to multiply by. And where is this coming from? Well, it's coming from a numerically controlled oscillator, which is going to get nudged around by the error signal that we're going to calculate. So I'll show you how to calculate that error signal that I mentioned. So after you do this multiplication, what comes out is a complex number. And I'm going to split this up into its real part, x, and its imaginary part, y. And what's going to happen here in the Costas loop is if everything is locked and working, these x's and y's should be locked onto the points that we care about. And at least in the GNU radio block, this x and y after this multiplication is the stuff that comes out of the block as a, as a complex number. So this is what comes out of the out of the Costas loop block. So what is actually happening here? Well, we need to calculate that error term. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take x and we're going to threshold it. We're going to ask which side of the complex, which side of the axis am I on? So we basically have to find the nearest constellation point. And at least for QPSK, that's pretty easy. You just take this and you pass it through a thresholder that spits out either a plus one or a minus one. And this is an estimate for A. So this is an estimate for the in phase part of A. So A sub I. Might not be our final decision for what this, what this incoming symbol was, but it's, it's an estimate that's good enough to proceed. And we'll do the same thing with the imaginary part here. We'll pass it through a thresholder. and get an estimate for where, uh, 
where along the imaginary axis? Was I above the imaginary axis or below the imaginary axis for, for this particular incoming symbol? Now I want to do this, this cross product, this cross multiply. So I need to take, take this and multiply by x. So this comes in and gets multiplied by x coming down. And I need to take this one and multiply by y coming up. And I'm going to form the difference of those. So the, the x that's multiplied by q here, um, that is that was the the I drew this upside down before I drew it. That was the negative term. So I'm going to sum these up, but I'm going to sum this one with a negative sign. And that is going to be an estimate of my error. So that is sort of a pretty good approximation to my error theta. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this estimate of my error through a smoothing, smoothing low pass filter pass filter that's then going to go into this numerical controlled oscillator and either slightly speed this up or slightly slow it down and the the bigger the error the the more it's going to get pushed around in order to come come into lock and when this numerical controlled oscillator is is oscillating at the right speed and also with the right phase this error term is going to be zero and it's not going to be nudged around a little bit now, of course, there's always a lot of noise. And so any individual estimate of theta is going to be really off. So we want to average over many, many of these. So kind of on the order of 100. And, and that, will, that will be our numerical controlled oscillator. So let me show you a version of that in action with a different flow graph. All right, here, here I'm showing a slightly modified version of the symbol timing uh, Simple timing uh, diagram from last time, flow graph from last time. I have my frequency locked loop back in, so I don't have to bother tuning things by hand. This gets the frequency close, but not exact. I have my, my symbol sync again. And now I'm going to examine a little bit more about the Costas loop. So everything up to this point was exactly the same, but I'm going to look at not just what comes out of the Costas loop, like I did last time, but also look at these kind of debugging parameters. The frequency that it's it's outputting, the the phase that it thinks it's at at any given time, and this error term. And another thing I've put on a slider is the bandwidth. So the bandwidth of the Costas loop, the suggested bandwidth is something like two pi over a hundred. So two pi times 0.01, and I'm going to put that 0.01 on a slider to show what happens if you increase or decrease this bandwidth. So this is basically increasing or decreasing the amount of smoothing. And we'll see what happens to, to all of these, these parameters here on the Costas loop. So um, everything should be exactly the same. Everything, everything works. I'm transmitting, transmitting a signal, um, receiving automatic gain control, frequency compensation, I have these eye diagrams, everything looks good. Um, okay, so here's, here's the, the real, the, the new stuff is down here. My Costas loop has locked. I have these four little dots here, these four little red dots. And now I'm looking at the error term for my Costas loop, which is this blue, blue line that's sort of uh, going around zero and I have my Costas frequency. So this is what it thinks the frequency is in radians per second. And this is pretty much zero because I'm, the frequency lock loop has tried to compensate as much as possible for any carrier offset, but you can see that its best estimate of, of the incoming frequency is bouncing around a little bit. And this is the phase. So if the clocks were truly, uh, truly running at the same rate or even truly off by some constant, the, the phase should just be linear and then it'll reset. You know, after, after two pi of travel, it'll reset. You can see that the phase isn't quite linear. It's moving around a little bit, but this is what has to happen in order to keep point after point after point locked right onto where we need it locked. All right, so let me change the bandwidth of this filter and see what happens. So first, let me increase the bandwidth. And now 
you'll notice a couple things. As I increase the bandwidth a little bit, the error goes up and my Costas frequency gets a little bit more noisy. So I'm basically letting through more, more noise. I'm not, I'm not filtering as aggressively. And if I get really lax about my filtering, my, my frequency estimate's gonna kind of go all over the place and my points are gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm not gonna have locked very well. Let me go the other way. Let me make the bandwidth really tight. Making the bandwidth really tight. So that's about where it default is. Making the bandwidth really tight will keep actual true errors from nudging around the, the Casas loop. And again, what happens is the, the, the red points in the constellation grow. And so uh, what's happening here is I'm, I'm not responding fast enough to compensate for true errors. And, and now the, the red frequency is pretty smooth, but the errors are all over the place. So I need to allow some, some balance of, of true timing errors to come through and influence my compensation oscillator, but, uh, but not so much noise. Uh, but not, yeah, not so much noise that I just get bounced everywhere. So there's kind of a sweet spot that's somewhere around 1% uh, of, of 2 pi. So somewhere around 0.01 is, is the sweet spot, at least for you know, this, this particular setup. Your setup may require different tuning. All right, and all of this works. So I did, I did all this example for binary, or for, sorry, for, for QPSK, for quadrature phase shift keying with four constellation points. All of this works equally well for binary phase shift keying. And in case, and in fact, the, the, uh, the flow graph is even easier because my constellation only has a real part. So if I look at my, my constellations for QPSK, there are four points here, 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 and here. But if I look at my constellation for BPSK, binary phase shift keying, I only ever have a real plus or minus one. And so when I make my decision, I'm always gonna decide that the imaginary part of A, this AQ is zero. So for binary phase shift keying, I can just set this, this whole thing equal to zero for, for BPSK. And so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't even matter what's coming in on the real side. All that matters is what's coming in on the imaginary side. And this makes sense because if I have some data that's sort of a little bit high here, it, it doesn't matter that the real part has, has gotten a little bit smaller. What really matters is the fact that the imaginary part has gotten a little bit positive. So that's, what hap that's what's happening here. For the green data that's coming in, the imaginary part is slightly positive and that gets multiplied by a plus one for this star. And if I'm rotated here, I'd be rotated in this direction. Here, the imaginary part is a little bit negative and I would be multiplied. So that ne slightly negative thing will be multiplied by a negative decision for the real part. And so whether I'm, uh, no matter what my data is, I'm always gonna be constructing the correct error for BPSK. And so uh, it, it's, a, it's a little bit simplified. But what this means is that the Costas loop needs to know what constellation you're using. And if I were to share my screen and I look at the parameters of the Costas loop here, you have to specify the order. So for QPSK, the order is four, and this is how you get the order, the order of a constellation. You call this arity function. That just means how many points are in the constellation. Uh, the order is four. And if I switch all this to BPSK, let me go up on top and switch it to BPSK. the order should, should switch to two and all this should work for that too. And BPSK should be a little bit more forgiving. Let me go all the way down to the bottom. It should be a little bit more forgiving on, um, on the, the loop bandwidth here. I should be able to go a little bit further in each direction and the decision should still be pretty good. So here I'm, I'm a little too tight and getting too loose, I'm not, I'm not a little, I'm not exactly sure why it slows down. My computer definitely slows down when I let in too much uh, uh, 
uh, I let in too much here. So I'm not going to go to this extreme because I think Zoom might might have some trouble. When we did this phase carrier synchronization, we just had a cluster of points and we locked it to the nearest symbol. And there's no way we could tell if this little cluster of points here was really supposed to be a plus one and that one was a minus one, or if we were wrong and we just happened to get a, a cluster of points where the one up here was a minus one and the one down here was a plus one. So for BPSK, there's still gonna be a residual 180 degree phase ambiguity. At, even after we've done this locking, we're not gonna know whether we locked on and we're getting out uh, ones, plus ones and minus ones that we put in or we're getting the opposite sign out. And similar for QPSK, there's actually a, a four-way ambiguity. So we'll just lock our little constellation of four to the nearest one, but we still have to figure out which of these four is the right one. And there are two techniques for that, which I'll talk about next time. All right, I don't, I don't know how I'm gonna fix that. I might just have to you know, stay up all night and re-record this.